On the morning of the second day, Nathan yawned and stretched out comfortably. He had gone back to sleep in the treetops above the owl's nest and had rested peacefully without interruption until sunlight had pierced the canopy and hit his eyes. Now bird calls serenaded his morning as he scratched his arms and wondered how many trial takers had made it through the night. Way off in the distance, he'd spotted several campfires and he knew that all those warriors were inadvertently inviting attacks on themselves. He resolved to find himself a cold breakfast of wild blackberries and pine nuts. Not exactly a feast, but necessary fuel for the hard day ahead of him. After he'd eaten, he put the rest of his picked goodies in his small bag and once again started hiking toward the lake in the center of the region. He knew that few warriors would think to assault him now that it was morning, for hardly anyone else would have slept the first night, and many would be tired and afraid of conflict. Nathan hummed to himself pleasantly as his thoughts swirled on this topic. It seemed to him more likely that the bloodshed would occur most often at night, when the forest blocked out the moonlight and shrouded the ground in total darkness. Besides, nobody smart would be itching for a fight on only the second day. As Nathan made his way closer to the lake, the tree density thinned and more sunlight hit the forest floor. Nathan smiled as he purposely leaped through patches of sunlight. His confidence was through the roof now that he had a solid 30 points in his possession. After several hours, Nathan ended the morning by finding another dropped playing card, a red nine of hearts splattered in blood. No doubt the owner had run off after being attacked, and neither her nor the assailant had noticed the card when it dropped from her person. Nathan picked it up and hoped that the warrior had teleported out before being slain. He added it to his growing pile, another two points. After that, he continued combing the forest, but the number of dropped playing cards seemed to plummet. After all, by day two, anybody careless with their cards had already been eliminated. He searched in vain until the sun rose high above him and his stomach grumbled. Finally, Nathan followed a small creek down into the lake in the center of his region. He smiled and took a deep sip from the fresh running mountain water, then ate the rest of his foraged nuts for lunch. He then sat on the water's edge and listened for any sign of movement. A few different sets of old footprints in the nearby mud told him this was the place to look for other warriors. As he activated his spiritual awareness, what he found surprised him greatly a strange phenomenon he had not at all expected. Across the riverbank, he sensed the energy of six different warriors all gathered around one another. Although groups would naturally form eventually, it seemed to be extremely rare for one to form so quickly considering the Doom faction had tried to ensure close friends would not be placed in the same region together. Nathan frowned as his mind raced. What's this? Six people all in one place? Are all of them strangers? What would make them all agree to team up so quickly? I've got to see this for myself. Nathan leapt up from his spot and climbed up into the treetops. From there, he soared from limb to limb, quickly circumnavigating the lake in order to reach the other side. As soon as Nathan got there, he realized his initial guess had been mistaken. As he hid in the branches high above the small gathering, he realized that the group of warriors was not a band working together. Instead, each warrior hid in their own hiding spot, watching a lone trial taker who sat out in the open by the water's edge. Carved into a large stone beside the warrior was the word, traitor willing to barter cards. Now Nathan fully understood the situation. The other five warriors around him were lying in wait to see if someone else would approach the traitor. All of them wanted to see if the traitor was genuine or if there was some sort of trap or scheme involved. Clearly, many of the warriors had been sitting there for hours, waiting to see if anyone would approach the traitor 
whose head was shaved bald and who sat cross-legged with his eyes closed, humming to himself. Nathan sighed and reluctantly leaped out of the trees onto the ground in front of the trader. He had no interest in merely observing like the others. He felt the hidden warrior's eyes on him as he strode up calmly to the humming trader. If this warrior is genuine, perhaps he might have my matching card. Even if he doesn't have it, it seems like it might be worth the risk. After all, his power level doesn't seem that strong. Sure, it might be a trap, but it could also be an easy trade to get myself some points. The bald teen's humming stopped, and he gave Nathan a toothy grin. Howdy there, fella. What brings you to my humble trade stall? Nathan nodded back at him politely. Hello there, friend. How does this proposed transaction work exactly? The bald teen raised his head and shrugged nonchalantly. Simple. I will tell you the card I need to match with, he eased slightly. Is it really that simple? The bald boy nodded calmly. Sure. Sure. I mean, why fight when one doesn't have to? It's best to keep it simple, don't you think? That way, it's easy for both of us to get what we want, and for no suspicions to creep in. Because, obviously, anyone would have their fair share of suspicions. Nathan chuckled at the bald boy's chill demeanor. Aren't you worried that I'll just attack you once I find out what playing cards you have? At that, the bald boy's eyes narrowed slightly. Not at all. Either we swap or you attack me. Either way, there's no telling how things will turn out. Only the heavens know what the future holds in store for us. Besides, I don't have anything on me for you to steal. The bald boy pulled out his tunic pockets and revealed he was indeed sitting there without his playing card. Knowing that he must have stored it somewhere nearby, Nathan now realized why the other five warriors had held back for so long. Not only was he eerily calm, he might not even have any playing cards besides his own, and him hiding his own card made people understandably suspicious. Nathan sighed and shook his head, berating himself slightly for getting into this whole situation. Finally, he locked eyes with the boy and smiled once more. Well, tell me then, what playing card is it that you are looking for? The bald boy did not hesitate. I'm the black jack of clubs. If you've got a red jack of clubs, I'll trade with you now. If you've got my exact card, then let me know so we can fight and get this dueling business over with. Nathan immediately recalled one of the cards he'd found earlier was a red jack of clubs, and he began to grin excitedly. Don't worry, friend. I'm the red seven diamond. If you have that card, I'll exchange it for a red jack of clubs. Hearing Nathan's words, the bald boy's eyes immediately lit up. He stood up slowly and smiled. Really? Do you really own a red jack of clubs? If that's the case, I'd like some proof, please. Nathan nodded and swiftly took the red jack of clubs from a pocket and waved it out in front of the bald teen. Then the teen examined the card and whistled. He tried to touch it, but Nathan hid it back away in his pockets and spoke coldly. What about you? Do you have the card I need? If not, then there's no trade. If you then wish to try to steal it, you're welcome to try. The bald teen laughed and patted Nathan on the shoulder. <laughs> it is fate, then. The heavens have decided it. I just happened to have been attacked by a red seven diamond who tried to rob me yesterday afternoon. Come on, then. Why don't we make the swap? So then, you don't have it on you. No, no, of course not. That would be far too dangerous. We'll have to go together to where I have stored them. Here, I'll even throw in an extra card for your troubles and to show you I trade with you in good faith. So, what do you say? Nathan paused for a moment, then offered out his hand. We have a deal. The bald teen smiled and shook his hand. Excellent. Then let's be off at once. I'll show you the way. It's not too far from here. The teen motioned off toward a nearby mountain peak 
and headed off in his direction, pausing only once to nod for Nathan to follow him. Gradually, Nathan fell in behind the bald youth, and the two of them left the ground's gaze down by the water. However, it wasn't long before Nathan noticed a secret figure stalking them up in the treetops. He tensed up, uncertain if trouble lay ahead. Nathan kept his eyes on the ground in front of him as the bald teen led them up out of the tree line and onto a perilous mountain pass. Even then, Nathan would occasionally look over his shoulder and sense the presence of somebody down behind him. Suddenly, a bird call rang out from the forests down beneath him, and immediately Nathan grew more relaxed as if he understood its message. Meanwhile, the bald-headed boy and Nathan took turns leading on the path, and the sun began to lower in the sky as it became late afternoon. Nathan sighed as he switched off back to the rear again for the tenth time. How much further did you say it was, friend? Oh, sorry. I know it's farther than I first said. I realize now it's a bit of a journey up, but going down goes by much faster. I swear to you, though, we're almost there. It's just beyond us on the other side of the mountain. The bald boy pointed down to a crevice where two mountains met together. A large animal of some kind had at one point used the mountain trail to dig a cave tunnel through to the other side, and now Nathan stared into the black abyss of the cave beneath him. He gave the bald teen a questioning look. You better really have that red seven of diamonds, so help me if we walked all the way out here for nothing. The teen merely grinned. Please, my friend, understand my predicament. I needed a place nobody would find, a place where nobody could casually snatch it from my hiding spot and knock me out of the trial. If it was easy to get to, it wouldn't be a good hiding spot now, would it? I know it doesn't look good, but I swear it's just beyond that cave. You better promise me that there'll be no funny business now. Don't worry. I promise. No tricks. I'll go in first, so I have my back to you if it makes you feel any better. I swear on my family's honor that I have the card you're looking for. Nathan sighed, then reluctantly nodded for the bald teen to continue. The teen smiled, then disappeared into the cave. Nathan looked back one last time over the rocky terrain, then followed the boy into the darkness. Nathan blinked as his eyes adjusted to the dim lighting of the mountain crevice. He could just barely make out the outline of the bald teen in front of him as they walked through the darkened tunnel toward light coming from a nearby exit. The bald teen moved swiftly through the space as Nathan casually spoke to the back of his head. Huh, quite a dark little hiding spot you've got here. One could easily hide a couple traps up here in the darkness. I'd say this might just be the perfect place for an ambush. Nathan sensed that the bald teen in front of him trembled. The bald boy slowed his pace and grinned reassuringly. Huh. I hope that's just a joke, my friend. We're almost there. The card you need is in a little notch in the mountain, just past the exit over there. Just wait here for a moment, please. Nathan calmly stood where he was told, and his eyes coldly followed the bald teen as he raced out through the other end of the cave and then dug his hand into a slight crack in the mountain wall. Nathan's head turned slightly as the boy struggled to reach for something hidden inside. Do you need any help over there? No worries, friend. Just wait inside there. I'll grab what you need in a moment. Suddenly, the bald boy's expression changed into that of a malevolent grin as he pulled a secret rope lever that he'd hidden in the rock crack. Ha <laughs> ha, you naive little fool. You really thought I had your token now, didn't you? Enjoy the afterlife, idiot. Before Nathan could react, the rope lever triggered something deep within the cave. The entire structure began to rumble as Nathan inhaled deeply. Whistling sounds filled Nathan's ears 
as dozens of poisoned darts shot out from the cave walls on both sides of him. As Nathan braced up defensively, another rumble in the cave nearly shook him off balance. The bald teen had been extra careful, so to ensure his victim's death, he'd added a massive overhead boulder to the trap. A giant rock fell from the cave ceiling down toward Nathan's head. In a matter of seconds, he'd be squashed like a pancake or riddled with darts like a porcupine. The bald boy licked his lips excitedly as he waited for his traps to do their work. His mind obsessed over what potential playing cards Nathan might have in his bag. That is, until something the boy thought was impossible happened. As the traps headed straight toward their target, Nathan finished inhaling and suddenly exhaled deeply as his black spiritual energy suddenly shot out in all directions. Just as the poison darts were about to reach his skin, they shattered instantly against Nathan's energy field. At the same moment, the boulder crashed down on Nathan's head. However, rather than smash Nathan to the ground, the black spiritual energy shattered the rock into a million different pieces. The bald-headed boy's jaw dropped. A, a spirit shield? It can't be. That must mean you're a master level warrior. But how is that even possible? As Nathan coldly made his way out of the darkness of the cave and approached the bald teen, the trickster's face fell ashen. The power of Asura's spirit shield circled protectively around Nathan's entire body. The trickster had never anticipated he'd have to try to trap a master level warrior. After all, his traps had worked before, and everyone else he'd tricked had been no more than a mid-tier level apprentice. He simply wasn't prepared for a warrior as strong as Nathan. Nathan casually brushed off a bit of rock dust from his shoulder and sneered at the bald teen's look of shock and terror. Yep, that's what I thought. If you'd been smart enough to simply waste my time, I might have let you live. But after that little surprise, your fate is sealed. No, no, please. I had no idea you were a master-level warrior. You, you clearly suspected me beforehand and knew you were in no true harm. Uh, please understand. I am but a humble level five apprentice. I had no other way to win. Nathan did not speak as he strode closer to the teen. The bald kid's mind raced as he tried to plead with Nathan. Only moments before, He'd felt confident that Nathan was just another rat to fall into his trap, but now he realized that he was in fact the one who was caught. Realizing that begging for sympathy was failing, the bald teen tried a new tactic, forcing his tone to sound calm and casual again. <sighs> Go ahead then, kill me. There's no point in doing so, but do as you please if it'll make you feel better. My playing card isn't here anyways. Nathan's eyes rolled as he shook his head and drew his broadsword. Do you really think I'd fall for that now after all the lies you've already told me? No. Enough with the bullshit. You have it on your person somewhere. Why would you hide it away from you in the first place? You'd have to constantly go back there and check that it's still hidden. Besides, if you moved too far away from it, you'd get teleported out. No. You're much too smart for all that. The bald teen sighed and nodded his head in defeat. Very well then, here you go. I will give you all of my cards if you just let me live. The trickster approached Nathan with a hand in his pocket. However, what he produced was not a playing card, but a poisoned knife that he plunged at Nathan's chest. <laughs> Take that, asshole. If I have to go down, you're come. Hagar grinned at Nathan and nodded back at him. His eyes narrowed at specks of blood on Nathan's tunic. Nathan, my friend, are you all right? I heard a loud noise echo out from the mountains, so I raced over as soon as I could. Nathan noticed Hagar's gaze and began to roughly clean off the blood from his shirt as he patted his friend's shoulder and smiled. <laughs> it's fine, Hagar. Truly. I'm all right. The trickster has been slain. 
Thank you for your warning bird call. Without that, I wouldn't have been so relaxed. For a while there, I thought you were working with them to entrap me. Hagar grinned and nodded. Of course, my friend. I had a feeling you would recognize the call. After you moved in on his trading post, I knew I had to follow you to make sure you survived. My father's spies are experts at various bird calls, including ones from other fiefdoms. I'd only guessed that the trickster wouldn't notice a distinctive blue-haired thrush call from Dunshire, but I knew you'd recognize it and know it was a signal. Nathan smiled at his friend and nodded knowingly. At first, Nathan had been puzzled by the call of his homeland's native bird in such a foreign place. But after he'd gone farther along with the bald teen and heard the call a few more times, he'd recognized it as a warning call to him. The farther off he went with the bald warrior, the louder the bird call got, as if alerting him to incoming danger. This had given him the time he needed to mentally prepare himself for whatever treachery the bald teen had in store for him. I thank you, Hagar, once again. Your friendship has proved invaluable to me. Come, let us depart this place and seek refuge before dark. Worry not. I have the perfect place for us to rest. Nathan followed Hagar through the dense trees of the forest. It had been hours since the ambush in the mountains, and now the moon hung high above them in the sky. As they reached a massive downed log, Hagar suddenly motioned for Nathan to join him inside of it and then disappeared. Nathan pushed his way into the log through the hole Hagar had gone through and found a small cylindrical shaped room inside the log that Hagar had already spread a large bed of leaves down over. Hagar smiled as he spread his arms wide and grinned. Welcome to my humble home, Nathan. Nobody will find us here for now. Thank you, Hagar. I appreciate your help and your hospitality. If I had any food or gear you might require, I would share it with you, but... Never mind that. Here, I have some berries picked fresh just this morning. It isn't much, but it's enough to get us to tomorrow. Hagar and Nathan shared the berries hungrily as Nathan nodded his thanks. As they finished up their meal, Hagar shook his head at Nathan as he licked his lips. You ought to be more careful, Nathan. That trickster back there could have bested you had you not been ready. It's wise of you to think of all the other trial goers as potential foes, not friends. And what about you, Hagar? Well, I'm a friend, of course. But you just so happen to know me from before. All I'm saying is, you might want to err on the side of caution for the time being. There are plenty of weak warriors around who'd happily slit your throat in the night if you gave them the chance. Nathan smiled politely at his anxious-looking friend. How could he reveal to him that Nathan's power was so great that it hardly mattered whether treachery was involved or not? Nathan hated scheming, so he relished an opportunity to teach the weak tricksters of the trial a lesson in honesty. Despite all this, he merely shrugged. I understand your concern, my friend. I'll do my best to pay better attention next time. By the way, how did you know the fellow was a trickster in the first place? Hagar smiled suddenly and held up something in his palm. <laughs> well, this told me right away that he was lying. Look! Nathan squinted at the item in his friend's hand, and as Hagar held it up to the moonlight, his eyes widened. It was a red seven of diamonds. Finally, Nathan had found his matching card. Nathan couldn't believe his luck. Held out right before his eyes was the red seven of diamonds playing card that matched his own. Hagar smiled back at him as he let Nathan take the card and laid back in his bed of leaves inside of their downed log hideout. I found it on a squeamish-looking warrior on the very first day. As soon as I said hello to the lad, he vomited and then threw his card at me and ran. Once I overheard the bald trickster say that he possessed the card instead, I knew that he was lying to you. Incredible, Hagar. I can't believe you found it. <laughs> no worries there, my friend. Its value is far greater to you than to me, so please keep it. 
Nathan bowed profusely at his friend as he smiled. Thank you, Hagar. Here, come check the cards I have collected. See if any of these are some use to you as well. Nathan spread out his collection of playing cards before Hagar, who examined them all closely. Also immediately, Hagar's eyes widened. No way! You, you have the black two of hearts! Yes way, in fact I do. I just took it off of the trickster only hours ago. Crazy. It's as if the heavens themselves are shining down on both of us. Here, take it. Thank you so much, Nathan. With that card now, I've got over 56 points. Hagar smiled as he gently placed his new card in his bag with the others. Nathan smiled at his friend as he too laid back in a thick pile of leaves. Very impressive. Not at all bad for two days of work. How about you, Nathan? What's your score now? Nathan did the mental math in his head and smiled at his friend. With this matching card, I'm now up to 70 points. Just 10 more points, and then I'll have enough to cross. Nathan grinned, and Hagar's eyes widened with shock. All Nathan needed now was five more random cards, or another seven of diamonds of either color, and he'd have everything he'd need to advance into a different region. Wow, Nathan, you're so close. How'd you get so many cards so quickly? Nathan shrugged and rolled over in his leaf bed. Dumb luck, I guess. I was attacked just last night by a guy who also had a bunch of cards I needed. Without him, or that trickster guy, I wouldn't be as relaxed as I am right now. My plan is to cross over into another region quickly, sometime tomorrow morning, so I can find more warriors with matching cards. That way, I can really start to build up points as fast as possible. Nice plan, Nathan. Nobody would ever accuse you of not being ambitious, that's for sure. What about you, Hagar? When do you plan to try to cross? Hagar smiled bitterly, then shook his head. Oh, oh yes, about that. I don't think I'll be crossing anytime soon, Nathan, if at all. In truth, I'm sitting pretty with my points, and I don't want to risk teleporting to another area with stronger enemies that could rob me. As things stand here, I'm confident I can defeat or defend against any of the warriors in our region that might come for me, but if I leave, I'm walking into an unknown scenario. There might be packs of high-level apprentices just waiting to hunt someone like me down. Huh. That's a good point. I'd say that I'd have your back, but in truth, I don't have any guarantee that they'd keep us together. More than likely, they just purposefully separate us to make it harder. Exactly. That's what I suspect as well. That's why my plan moving forward is to live off the land, find a good place to hide, and wait out the rest of the month. Then I can get used to the land here and use it to my advantage to avoid detection. If I were to teleport out, I'd lose that edge, and it's a risk I'm just not willing to take. Nathan nodded at his friend's wise words. He did not think less of Hagar for utilizing this strategy and playing into his own tactical strengths. After all, the competition included warriors aged 20 and under, so there were plenty of older warriors in other regions that could slay Hagar. Would you like to go fishing, Hagar? Sure I would, Nathan. But we don't have any reels or bait. Nathan's eyes scanned the water's edge all along the lake as he sniffed the air. That's not the type of fishing I'm talking about. Nathan smiled as he activated his spiritual awareness and confirmed his suspicions. Both of them were being watched by no less than eight different warriors, three of which seemed to have formed some sort of team. Hagar frowned for a moment before he got Nathan's meaning and his lips curled up into a smile. What exactly did you have in mind? It was late in the morning when Nathan finally got a big bonfire going on some rocks just beside the lake. Meanwhile, Hagar had harpooned a couple of small fish from the shallow waters of the lake, and the two youths sat and roasted their catches over the fire. Suddenly, 
the three youths Nathan had detected earlier appeared. All three of them were tattoo-faced Howlanders who snarled menacingly as they held out their spiked maces threateningly. Their leader, a tall boy with a tattoo that ran the length of his forehead, sneered as he approached. You two, hand over your cards and your catches if you wish to live. Otherwise, prepare to face our fury. Hagar casually turned his head and looked over his shoulder at them, while Nathan didn't even bother moving. Hagar cleared his throat. <clears throat> well, Nathan, they seem pretty serious. I think we might have to do what they say. Nathan merely chuckled and focused on his smoking fish. Sorry, did you say something? I've been far too focused on this delicious fish you caught us. Hagar smiled. Ah, uh, you're right. Sure does look good. Maybe we can deal with these guys later, after we eat. The tall, tattooed leader's face grew red as he realized they were mocking him. Ignore us at your peril, weaklings. Take this! The tall leader charged at the back of Nathan's head with his mace raced up to strike. His followers also charged together toward Hagar. Nathan merely sighed and handed Hagar his smoked fish stick. Here, hold this for a second. In a matter of seconds, Nathan leapt up from where he was sitting and viciously dispatched all three Howlanders in the blink of an eye, cutting the leader's body in half while drawing his sword and then cutting the mace-wielding arms off of both of the other two warriors who fell screaming to the ground. Nathan merely loomed over the two wounded warriors and quickly snatched their cards from their pockets. Their screaming ceased as they gradually began to glow yellow and faded out as if out of thin air, no doubt teleporting back into the encampment where their wounds would immediately be dressed. Hagar sighed as he got up and approached Nathan, who snatched up the dead warrior's card and then flicked the blood of his blade. Ah, oh, come on now, Nathan. Now you're just showing off. You could have at least let me handle one of them. And risk our fish burning up in the fire? No way. Well, what do they have on them? Nathan pooled a bloody pile of playing cards together by the fire and began to count. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. They've got 14 cards here between the three of them, so 28 points in total. Hagar smiled excitedly as he handed Nathan back his smoked fish. Incredible! 28? That's 14 points for each of us. So I'm at 70, and you're at 84. Nathan shook his head as he bit into his fish and feasted on meat for the first time in three days. As he spoke, his mouth was still half full of food. No, my friend, I only need 80 points to cross. You take the extra four points. That'll put you at 74, which should be good enough to get you into the top 100. Thank you. Heck, yeah, this is awesome. Now my plan really has a chance to work out great. So, so what do we do now? Are you going to leave right away? Nathan shook his head as he continued eating. What's the rush? I've got good food and a warm fire. I'll enjoy a meal here with you for as long as I can. And then this evening, I'll leave. Who knows? Perhaps we'll come across another big catch. The sun rose high into the sky as the two boys finished their meal and lounged beside their giant fire, practically daring anyone in the area to come attack them. Although the bodies of the Houselanders had disappeared, their bloodstains remained soaked across the rocky shoreline, and so nobody immediately came after them. Eventually, Nathan grew bored and threw off his tunic. Hagar's eyes narrowed. What are you doing? What do you mean? I spent the past three days in the woods. It's high time I have a bath. Besides, who knows if there will be a water source like this in the next place. Nathan dove into the water and swam along the shoreline, beckoning out for Hagar to join him. Come on in, man. The water's nice and cold. Hagar shook his head and eyed the shoreline wearily. 
Are you sure that's such a good idea? You're like a sitting duck out there. Exactly. That's the point, isn't it? I'm the bait. I thought I was the bait, and you were the fisherman. Both of us are both. Come on in. Hagar rolled his eyes and stayed by the fire. Suit yourself. I'm going for a swim. I'll be back in a sec. Nathan dove back under the water and swam across the shoreline, scanning the treetops for any sign of movement. As he turned a corner, he came into a small cove. Immediately, his playful smile dropped. His eyes widened as he stared at something deeply disturbing. Nathan turned around and swam as fast as he could back toward Hagar and the fire. Hagar! Hagar! Get over here quickly! There's something here you need to see! And tried to pull him up and away from the body. Come on, Nathan. Well, let's just go. Maybe he had a personal grudge with another warrior or something. A personal grudge? This kid can't be more than a hundred pounds soaking wet. What's done is done, Nathan. There's no use burying him since they'll teleport him home soon. Let's just go back to the log hideaway for now. We can rest up for a bit before we say goodbye. Reluctantly, Nathan nodded and left the maimed corpse. He followed Hagar through the woods as they headed off away from the lake. Nathan and Hagar had bushwhacked through the forest for only a few miles when they happened upon another corpse. This time, the mutilated body was missing both an arm and a leg. Nathan shuddered as he looked away from the dead teen's resentful face. Meanwhile, Hagar searched the surrounding area for the missing limbs. I can't find his left arm or leg anywhere. Still think it's just a personal grudge? Hagar sighed and shook his head. Clearly, the intended effect worked on Hagar as he wildly scanned the trees around them and couldn't help but shiver as hairs stood up on the back of his neck. No, no, I don't. Nathan gritted his teeth again as he spoke coldly. It looks to me that we've got a sadistic hunter on our hands, someone who isn't so much concerned with cards as they are killing. Nathan frowned as he paced back and forth in front of this new body. He hadn't anticipated someone so vicious would already be hunting down other trial takers this early on in the challenge. He'd have thought that most warriors would still be building up their shelters or searching for food at this point, not stalking other competitors. Finally, Nathan got an idea of what to do. His grimace slowly turned into a smile. Hagar's eyebrows raised. What is it, Nathan? Should we go back to the lake or hide out in the trees? Someone's clearly hunting down anyone they can find. Exactly. Which means they've got a ton of cards on them. After what I've seen this person do, I've got no issues with hunting down the hunter myself. Typically, Nathan had no interest in starting fights with innocent warriors who minded their own business. Instead, he'd much rather have his enemies come to him and instigate the fights themselves. However, in this case, he had no such qualms about tracking down a sadistic mutilator. Come on, Agar. Let's keep going. A trail of blood seems to lead off in this direction. Before Hagar could protest, Nathan took off leaping into the tree canopies and flew off deeper into the woods. So Hagar sighed and then reluctantly followed his friend directly into the unknown danger. As the two youths leapt from branch to branch in the trees, their eyes scanned the forest floor beneath them. Both of them were amped up and vigilant, for they knew that the warrior they hunted would definitely be extremely powerful. Few warriors would be so bold as to openly attack and mutilate other warriors in broad daylight, so both of them were certain that their prey was also confident in their abilities. Although Nathan felt comfortable tackling any challenger that came his way, Hagar knew that without Nathan, his life would be severely threatened. Although he wanted to run, 
His thoughts swirled around as he considered what would happen if Nathan left him now. Perhaps Nathan is right. If he leaves me to hide out here now that the lunatic murderer is on the loose, I might be the next one to wind up slaughtered. I don't like having to do this, but it's best for the two of us to confront them now. That way, Nathan can handle them if they prove too strong for me. Suddenly, Hagar noticed dark clouds rolling up as the boys continued racing through the trees. A rainstorm blew in and soaked them as they continued on with their pursuit. After Hagar almost slipped off of a branch, he turned to Nathan and frowned. This storm isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Perhaps we should take shelter and search again this evening? No. We must not lose the blood trail now while we have it now. I won't let that sadistic murderer get away with this. As the sun disappeared behind a thick layer of rain clouds, the two warriors finally approached a third disfigured body on the forest floor. Nathan and Hagar leapt down out of the canopy and stood over the latest victim. This time, however, Nathan noticed the female warrior's eyes blink. Hagar, look! This one's still alive! Hagar shook his head in disbelief. This poor warrior was still breathing, yet they were somehow in a sorrier state than the last two victims. All this warrior's limbs were gone, but for some reason, the killer had left her alive. Nathan spat as he thought of the killer's reasoning. The idea left an awful taste in his mouth. That foul bastard. Whoever did this left her alive to bleed out and suffer on purpose. What a dishonorable thing to do. I swear on the heavens, I'll strike this sadist down myself. As Nathan stood over the woman to block out the rain, he noticed her playing card was crumpled up and placed on top of her. Nathan slowly unfolded the card and began to shake, not out of fear, but out of rage. His face grew red as his eyes narrowed. He knew this could only mean one thing. The murderer had deliberately left the woman's playing card beside her body to prevent her from being teleported out of the region and given medical aid. After realizing her card was not valuable to him, the sadist had wished to leave her to bleed to death and crumpled up the card. Before Nathan could speak, Hagar rushed up to the woman's side and held a couple fingers to her throat to check her pulse. While doing so, his eyes widened and he took a step back as the woman suddenly coughed up blood. Hagar took a rag from his back pocket and wiped the blood from her face as he furrowed his brow. You, you, aren't you o Ophelia? Lady Ophelia of the House Windwell from Schuylerland? Ophelia coughed up blood again as her cloudy eyes cleared up slightly. Darkness. Nathan and Hagar woke up to the sound of birds in the nearby trees. Finally, the rain had stopped. It was early in the morning when they climbed out of their downed log hideout and set off in the direction of the murder scenes of the previous day. The sky was bright, without a cloud in sight, as the two youths moved swiftly across the damp forest floor towards where Ophelia's body had been found. Suddenly, Nathan stopped. He held up a hand, signaling for Hagar to do the same. For a moment, the two boys listened to the sounds of the forest in total silence. Nathan's eyes narrowed. Immediately, he activated his spiritual awareness and sensed that several miles away, two trial takers were fighting. As Nathan concentrated and listened with his superior hearing, he realized it wasn't really a fight so much as a chase. One of the fighters was trying to flee for their lives, while another hunted them down relentlessly. Hagar frowned at Nathan's look of intense concentration. Nathan? What is it? What do you sense? Suddenly, Nathan's eyes widened. It's him. It's the killer. I sense he's a level nine apprentice, 
and he's striking again. So soon? <sighs> he's practically begging us to stop him. Well, let's see what he thinks of me. Quickly, follow me. With a single leap, Nathan jumped into the tree canopy. Hagar followed Nathan as the two youths disappeared into blurs as they leapt between branches at full speed, barreling toward the distant sounds of conflict coming from the southwestern corner of the region. A devilish laughter echoed through the trees. <laughs> the source of the sound was a sinister-looking young man with a peach fuzz mustache. He raced through the forest with a long, thin blade raised high above his head, chasing down a fearful boy whose clothes were already soaked in blood. The fearful boy nearly stumbled as he fled from his hunter, then cursed as he narrowly avoided a swipe of the mustached man's blade. You damn beast! Just leave me alone! I have no quarrel with you! <sighs> no quarrel? No quarrel? You're no fun is what you are. You can't even let me enjoy the thrill of the chase. Perhaps I'll move on to the next phase then. The fleeing boy's eyes widened as the madman suddenly appeared right before him with his sword held high. The scared boy shut his eyes and tried to jab at his attacker wildly. The fleeing boy screamed as the madman chopped his right arm off in a single cut. Blood spurted out onto a few nearby trees as the fleeing boy's sword dropped into the tall grass. Despite the pain, the fleeing boy tucked and rolled away before the madman could cut off his head as well. As the wounded boy ran, he knew he'd only have a few more minutes left before his blood loss would force him to the ground. Before then, he somehow had to get away from the madman chasing after him. The villainous laughter of his hunter echoed out through the woods behind the boy. <laughs> That's much better. Give me a proper chase now. Let's see how long you'll go before you fall. I hope you last at least as long as the others did. The wounded boy grimaced at the madman's words but he dared not turn back to see how close he was. His thoughts swirled around his gruesome situation. How can I possibly compete with this madman? He's at least a level nine apprentice, and I'm a mere level four. I just don't get it. Why play with me like this? If he just dueled me honorably, I'd be in the heavens already. But this sick freak seems to prefer the chase. The wounded boy tripped on a tree root, and crashed into the damp, muddy ground. Before he could get up again, the wild eyes of the hunter loomed right over him. His thin blade hung menacingly from his side, and droplets of the wounded boy's own blood fell down upon his face. The madman frowned and began to sigh. So much for a proper chase. You're even worse than the warriors in my last region. I guess it can't be helped. Say hello to the heavens for me. Seeing the madman's crazed expression, the wounded boy closed his eyes and despaired. He murmured a prayer to the heavens and hoped that his end would not be too painful. The madman raised his thin blade over his head and swiped down at the wounded boy's neck as if to cut off his head. The madman moaned as a walnut soared out of the dense forest foliage extremely quickly and knocked him in the head, thus ruining his sword strike. Sparks flew up as the madman's thin blade sliced into a rock instead of the wounded youth's flesh. The youth, sensing an opportunity to escape, hurriedly stood up and raced off into the woods without ever looking back again. The madman's face grew red with rage as he rubbed a fresh bruise on the top of his temple. His eyes scanned the forest wildly, searching for the culprit. Uh, who is it? Who dares to get in the way of me and my prey? Congratulations, 
You've ruined my mood and put yourself on the chopping block instead. A scornful voice echoed out of the woods, drawing the madman's attention as he raised his sword up menacingly in that direction. Hmm, I thought someone so vicious would at least have better reflexes than that. No matter. Normally I'd say I'll send you to the heavens, but the truth is, I doubt you'll ever get to go up there with your misdeeds. The madman approached the voice until suddenly its source appeared out from behind a tree. Nathan Hayfield brandished his sword and frowned, his stern warrior face in full effect. The madman smirked at Nathan, then stepped back defensively as he heard a rustle in the bushes behind him and spotted Hagar walking towards him with his sword out. The man licked his lips as his muscles tightened up. He seemed to be enjoying his own ambush. Talk all you want, fools. Even with the two of you, I'll cut one down and chase the other. You must be courting death to show your face in front of me. Don't you realize I'm a level nine apprentice? Even at 20, I'm exceptionally talented for my age. Nathan ignored the madman's boasts. Instead, he slowly moved closer to him and furrowed his brow. So you're the murderer from another region who's gone around cutting off limbs, isn't that correct? The madman's eyes twitched and his tone grew cold. Well, look at you and your rare knowledge. You don't seem so ordinary yourself. Perhaps I'll kill your friend first and have you run from me. <laughs> I'd never run from a bastard like you. Besides, I'm the one you want. Hagar, quickly! Suddenly, Hagar flung a playing card through the air, which Nathan caught and held up at the madman. It was Hagar's personal card. You're looking for this card, aren't you? The black two of hearts? Well, come and get it then. The madman's eyes lit up as Nathan waved the card in front of his face. He tightened his grip around his thin blade, and Nathan sensed the man's violent urges growing. The man's lips curled up into a creepy smile. You two sure are confident, I'll give you that. Perhaps we'll have a proper duel after all. Nathan shook his head. No, a proper duel is something that is earned. You lack the honor for such a fight. Instead, I'll merely slay you where you stand. Immediately, the madman's face grew red with rage. Veins bulged on his forehead as he screamed, You really are an audacious little rat, aren't you? I'm curious to see how mouthy you are after I skin you alive. In the blink of an eye, the madman charged Nathan with his sword raised. He was no fool, and it was clear to him that Nathan was the stronger warrior. If he slew him quickly, Hagar would most certainly run. But before the madman's blade could reach him, Nathan's eyes narrowed as he activated the power of Asura, and black energy began to flow around his body. He held out an empty hand threateningly toward his attacker and smiled. Asura Slaying Blade! Suddenly, the energy around his body formed into a massive black blade in Nathan's right hand. As he pointed the blade at his attacker, the energy sword's point shot out directly at him. The madman's eyes widened as he saw the massive energy blade coming right at his face. Immediately, he regretted his actions. Damn them! They tricked me into thinking they were weak! This guy must be a master level warrior. There's no way he could wield a spirit sword like that. Nathan's spiritual attack sliced through the madman's sword and snapped it in two as if it were paper. At the last moment, the madman's instincts took over and he rolled out of the way, narrowly avoiding a direct hit on his body. The madman's eyes widened as he looked behind him and saw a crater where he had just been standing. If he hadn't moved, he would have been completely crushed. 
The madman's head snapped back to Nathan as he cursed at him. His words were filled with jealousy. Fuck you, you little trickster. How can this be? You, you're not even an older teen yet, but somehow you've reached the master stage? That, is, that isn't fair at all. Why are you even being tested? Can't the Doom Faction just accept you and let us apprentice levels have a chance? Uh, stop bullying me with your ridiculous strength! Nathan snarled as he let his spirit sword dissipate and switched his family broadsword back into his right hand. Bullying you? You really must be mad. I'm not even 15 years old yet, and you're clearly 20. Besides, I'm not the one who toys with his prey and feeds off people's fear. Fourteen? No, you can't possibly be that young. The madman's eyes twitched again. For that kid to be that advanced at his age, he would no doubt one day stand out even amongst the Doom Faction warriors. There's no chance I can win against him now. Suddenly, the madman cowered and slowly stepped away from Nathan. Please, uh, have mercy on me. Uh, I, I didn't realize your strength. Uh, I submit to you now. I yield. Please, j just take my card. W won't you spare a yielding warrior? Nathan shook his head and smirked at the madman's hypocrisy. You didn't think about it that way when you were the victor, now did you? Why should I be any different? Please, you must understand... They were weaklings, not like you or I. I merely called them from the herd. The trial is a matter of life and death, after all. Uh, then you should understand why you must fall. Realizing that his pleas were failing, the madman's face grew red with rage once more. Fine then, I'll see you in hell. Drawing a long knife from his boot, the madman rushed at Nathan for one final desperate sneak attack. With all of his strength behind this one last ditch effort, he was sure he could at least bring down Nathan with him. However, Nathan immediately sensed the man's attack, and he was more than ready to finish him off. Single point power lunge! Nathan lunged straight past the madman's attack, and his longer blade point jabbed the man straight in his gut. A bloody mist burst out of the attacker's back as the small piercing blew up the man's internal organs. The madman looked at Nathan in disbelief, then crumpled to the ground, dead. Nathan scoffed at the dead body. There, that was for Ophelia and the others, you monster. As Nathan stood over the body of the sadistic murderer, he flicked the man's blood off of his blade and shook his head. His stern face melted into a smile as Hagar approached and patted him on the shoulder. Your strength never ceases to amaze me, Nathan. That warrior was strong enough to rampage through two entire regions, yet he fell almost immediately to your attacks. Words cannot express my gratitude. For now, I will be safer here for the remainder of that trial, but more than that, now House Windwell can rest easy, knowing that their daughter's death has been avenged." Nathan smiled bitterly and nodded at his friend. Although he was indeed a level 7 master, he'd been surprised by the level 9 apprentice's speed. Although his victory looked effortless, he'd had to use up a lot of his spiritual energy. Thank you, Hagar. I'm just glad he's no longer a threat to anyone trying to make their way peacefully through this contest. Perhaps you might go search for that injured warrior after I leave? Yes, Nathan, uh, of course. I'll be sure to make sure his wounds are mended before I go off into hiding. Now, on to the next matter. Let's see what cards he has. Nathan and Hagar searched the madman's body and quickly found a treasure trove of them in the man's purse hidden around his waist. Nathan's eyes widened as he waded through the pile of playing cards and found four cards of significance to him, two red seven diamonds and two black seven diamonds. He pocketed the cards and smiled as he became a hundred points richer just like that. 
Hagar shook his head as he continued counting them all out. Remarkable! This guy must have murdered half his home region before he came over here. Nathan nodded solemnly. My guess is he went to a central point, like our lake here, and then viciously hunted down anyone who approached it. Well, at least their lives were not in vain. Now you can use them to go on and be victorious. Hagar tried to hand him more cards from the pile, but Nathan shook his head. Don't worry about it, Hagar. I've got the four cards I need from this pile. You keep the rest. But Nathan, you're the one who defeated him, not me. It wouldn't feel right to take all of these cards. There's got to be at least another 50 points here. Exactly. That's why I want you to have them. Look, with the four cards I just pocketed, I've got 180 points now. That's more than enough for me to cross over to another region. I can always collect more cards over there, but here you'll need every extra card you can get your hands on since you're planning to hide out for the rest of the trial. Besides, these are all only worth two points each to me anyways. If you still believe that they're mine, then consider it a parting gift from me to you. Nathan smiled as his friend's shoulders slowly relaxed. He saw in Hagar's eyes how much this meant to him, as Nathan was basically giving him an opportunity to save up enough to qualify for the top 100 without having to fight more dangerous opponents in the future. Reluctantly, Hagar gave in to Nathan's request, but not before holding up a half dozen blood-soaked cards at the bottom of the purse. Fine. I'll take most of these, but, but here, you take these last few cards. I don't need them, and perhaps you'll be able to barter with warriors in the next region. That way, you won't need to keep fighting everyone you meet. Nathan smiled and accepted the final few cards. Very well then, Hagar. That sounds like a good plan to me. Why aimlessly search for enemies or matching cards when I could openly seek out others to trade and barter with? Your idea holds a lot of water. Suddenly, the wounded warrior's distant moans caught their attention and Hagar sighed. I'd better go deal with him before he loses any more blood. Thanks for everything, Nathan. Let's part ways for now and meet up again at the end of the month. Thank you, Hagar. And also, just a suggestion, but you might consider the cave high up in the mountain pass as a more permanent hiding spot. It's full of triggered booby traps, but once you clear that out, I don't think anyone will trouble you up there. Nice idea. I'll definitely go up there soon to check it out. I look forward to meeting up with you after this is over and calling you Duke Hayfield after you win first place. Nathan beamed at Hagar and they shared a brief embrace. Ah, thank you, my friend. As always, I appreciate your support. Until we meet again. Hagar waved to Nathan, who held out his personal playing card and activated his spiritual energy, which caused his skin to glow yellow and the portal hum to echo out around them. A bright flash of purple lit behind Hagar, and when he blinked again, he saw that Nathan had disappeared. For a moment, Hagar sighed and listened to the sounds of the forest, already missing his friend's company. Suddenly, Hagar's ears perked up as he turned around and started walking towards the injured warrior's voice. Oh, right, coming. Don't worry, friend. I'll heal your wounds for you. Suddenly, Nathan appeared back in the massive encampment right beneath the capital city's gates. The acolytes were just in the middle of dinner, around a crackling fire when he arrived, and as Nathan awkwardly turned around to face them, their eyes widened. The trial judge himself nearly gagged on his mead as his jaw dropped. Hmm, another warrior already? But the first one applied to cross only yesterday. What a bizarre trial year so far. The judge got up from his seat and left his companions to go confront the strange young boy. 
Can I help you, young warrior? Nathan grinned at the trial judge and nodded. Yes, uh, hello, sir. Sorry to interrupt your dinner, but I'd like to apply to cross into a new region. Suddenly, the trial judge blinked and nodded slowly in recognition. Ah, so it's you, the one who walked into the portal calmly. Now I understand. In the back of the judge's head, Officer Wilhelm's words came back to mind. He knew that he had to watch over this warrior carefully, for many of his masters had some sort of interest in him. No doubt, this interest had something to do with his skill, for applying to cross this early on in the trial was considered to be extremely rare. Nathan's brow raised, immediately noticing the judge's peculiar tone of voice. Understand what, sir? What's wrong? The trial judge did his best to recompose himself as he shook his head. Oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. It's just that someone already applied to cross yesterday, and now you've also come here. I'm a bit surprised, that's all. In a typical year, the trial judge was used to hundreds of trial goers dropping out or dying in the first couple of days. However, by day four, usually most survivors would have around 10 points or so. Usually, the strongest warriors would only apply to cross around 15 days into the trial. So having two warriors apply within the first four days was more than a little surprising. Before Nathan could respond, the trial judge motioned for him to come closer. Well, let's see your cards then. You better not be pulling my leg, because if you don't have enough points, I'll have to eliminate you from the trial. Nathan nodded and produced two matching red seven diamonds and a black seven of diamonds that he'd taken out of the sadistic warrior's purse. Of course, here you are, sir. 80 points, exactly. That was the requirement, right? Hmm, yes, yes, it was. The trial judge's brow frowned as he examined Nathan's cards. Suddenly, he gasped in disbelief as he realized that the cards were from Region 21, the region that the other warrior who had crossed over had been from. Are you okay, sir? Slowly, the old judge stroked his long white beard and began to chuckle. <laughs> so, that's how it is then, huh? It seems you've already slain the region crosser who teleported out before you. Nathan smiled and casually shrugged. Very well then, lad. Congratulations. Your application has been accepted. Please prepare to cross again. The trial judge handed Nathan back his cards. The wizened old man slowly made his way over to the front gate of the city and once again activated his spiritual energy and utilized the teleportation incantation. This time, a smaller yellow portal appeared with purple runes around it. Nathan smiled as he walked up to the old man and bowed his head respectfully. Thank you, good sir. I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> All right then. Just don't get too cocky, kid. You might just get your wish. But there's half a chance your corpse will come back to me without you. Nathan chuckled and shrugged. We'll have to see about all that. Until then, take care. This time, Nathan strutted confidently into the portal as a flash of purple light lit up the evening sky. In a matter of seconds, he was gone, and the trial judge sighed heavily. The old man ended his spell, but rather than return to his warm meal beside the fire, he leapt up onto the giant walls of the city and waited until he was completely alone and unwatched by any nearby guards. Only then did he activate his enchanted ring, and once again it began to glow. The trial judge cautiously whispered into the ring, as he stood facing the giant peaks of Mount Cal. Officer Wilhelm, 
come in. This is the trial judge. I've got something to report. Suddenly, the ring glowed even brighter and vibrated as Wilhelm's voice came through the small device. Go ahead, Zen. What is it? The youth you had me keep an eye on, the one that walked calmly through the portal, well, he just now came to me and applied to cross into another region. Ah, oh, really? How interesting. This rare sure does feel special, doesn't it? Wilhelm's voice over the enchanted ring grew louder with his own excitement. The Doom Faction officer had been alerted of a crossing just the other day, and now that Nathan had crossed as well, he had a feeling that the strangeness was only just the beginning. Not only that, sir, but the boy came to me with playing cards from the warrior who crossed over just yesterday. W which means... The boy killed him, or stole his cards. Either way, what a remarkable turn of events. Continue to keep an eye on him, and let me know if he tries to cross again. Again, sir? You really think he's capable of that? That's just it. I have no idea what he's capable of. Doesn't that fascinate you? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, of course, sir. While you're down there, have your acolytes whip off an observation globe for whatever region he's just gone into. I'd like to watch him in real time and see exactly how he's handling things. Well, that may take us a couple of days to complete, sir. A as you know, the level of spiritual energy needed is immense. Yes, yes, I understand. Well, You've got the better part of a month to finish it. I'd like for my deputies and me to observe him closely from our headquarters, if possible. Your wish is my command, sir. Very good. Now go and rest. Go eat more by the fire. I'm sure you're tired of standing up on that wall in the cold. The ring stopped glowing, and as soon as the trial judge was sure he was alone again, he sighed deeply and shuddered. A strange trial year may be good for the faction overall, but it wasn't exactly easy for him to handle on his own. A cold eastern wind scoured the top peak of Mount Cal, throwing up old snow onto the ramparts of the dark tower that housed the Doom Faction's Calandria Kingdom headquarters. Inside the massive tower, Head Officer Wilhelm lowered his enchantment ring and turned to face his four deputies, who stood patiently in front of him. Wilhelm couldn't help but chuckle at Deputy Officer Kane as he spoke. Heh, <laughs> you four won't believe this. Nathan Hayfield applied to cross this evening. It seems this boy's been blessed with a large heaping of luck. The four deputies nodded their heads, more than a little impressed. Deputy Kane couldn't help but grin. I had a feeling he'd do well. It's not just luck, sir. I believe the boy has an incomparable work ethic, and his future potential is through the roof. Wilhelm smiled as he went over to a nearby bar table and poured four drinks from a bronze flask in the shape of a dragon. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. You'll love this also, then. It appears he's killed that wild 20-year-old who crossed over yesterday. Perhaps that man was not so lucky after all. Everyone's eyes widened at this news, which the deputies found to be even more surprising. All of them had heard the other day of the mysterious 20-year-old who'd slaughtered his way viciously through the region he started in. While some, like Deputy Kane, found the boy to be disturbing, other deputies argued that there were few trial rules so that all forms of warriors could find their way into the Doom Faction's ranks. Even if the kid was a sadistic killer, perhaps he could be of use to them. After all, the trial was supposed to be a pure meritocracy. The strongest would flourish while the weak would fail. Thankfully for Deputy Kane, he no longer had to entertain the idea of the torture-loving murderer joining up with them. The deputy cleared his throat as he stepped forward and bowed his head toward his master slightly. Officer Wilhelm, 
The Hayfield boy's development has already far exceeded our wildest expectations. As a matter of fact, before you received this intel, I was going to inform you that the boy has apparently done something even more impressive. Officer Wilhelm's eyebrows raised. More impressive than this? Do tell us what you mean, Deputy Kane. Apparently, my scouts report that before arriving to participate in the trial, Nathan engaged in a secret duel outside of Godrickshaw with Duke Godrickson himself. Although the exact details of the duel are unclear, the redwood forest around them was left devastated, and it seems as though they fought one another to a stalemate. Despite Nathan's best efforts, and the Duke's own efforts to keep their conflict secret, it was no surprise to anyone in the room that Deputy Kane had obtained such information. Doom Faction deputies were master intelligence gatherers, and nothing of significance happened within the assigned fiefdoms that they didn't know about. Officer Wilhelm shook his head and rubbed his brow as he considered Kane's words. If that's really the case, then Nathan Hayfield must be at least a level 7 spiritual fighting master, if not a level 8. Hmm. With such talents, he may yet prove to be a true spiritual genius, a sword-fighting prodigy worthy of respect, even when compared to the other warriors in our faction. We must all watch closely and see how this youngling handles himself. Then, once the results are in, I'll bring this matter up to the faction leaders personally. Officer Wilhelm chuckled as he offered up four goblets of liquor to his underlings. His mood was jolly as he considered the praise he might receive from the faction leaders if Nathan turned out to really be as strong as he seemed to be. Here, each of you, a goblet of dragon's flame to celebrate. Cheers to another exciting trial year goblets clinked together. The four deputies clinked their glasses and smiled at their pleased superiors. Cheers! Internally, Kane couldn't help but grin and wished to scream out with pride for the youth from his fiefdom's domain. Incredible. Nathan never fails to impress. I'll pray to the heavens tonight to hope for his success. If he can just survive the next 25 days... He'll earn his place among us for sure. Then, there's no telling how far his star will rise. A brilliant flash of light blasted a darkened strand of trees, and suddenly Nathan appeared inside of a brand new trial region. He blinked as his eyes adjusted to the low light of the forest floor around him. Then, he sighed and spoke to himself under his breath. Another forest again, I guess. Looks like I'll have to climb another tree to get my bearings. But just as Nathan was able to leap up into the nearest tall tree, he suddenly froze up as his superior hearing picked up the sounds of breathing coming from a large bush directly behind him. Nathan sighed and slowly turned around to face his stalker. I've been here less than a minute, and already somebody's come to pick a fight with me. Boy, my luck sure does fluctuate. Perhaps I should have just stayed with Hagar after all. After a quiet moment, Nathan shrugged and decided to flush out the observer in the bushes. Nathan snarled as he approached it and shouted, I see you! Stop trying to hide in there! Come and face me like a warrior if you've got something to say! Suddenly, a deep voice echoed out from within the bushes. <coughs> Fine, you caught me. A figure leaped out of the bush and landed directly in front of Nathan. In dim evening light and underneath the shadow of a tall tree, Nathan was unable to make out more than a silhouette of the figure as it sneered at him. <laughs> I didn't expect you to be so vigilant. No matter. It makes no real difference to me. Are you just going to stand there? Or are you going to step out of the shadows and tell me who you are? Nathan waited patiently 
as the figure took a step forward and came out of the tree's shadow to reveal himself. The boy was dressed in all black and dual wielded a pair of short swords common amongst a small group of assassins known to live along the kingdom's mountainous border region. Nathan smiled as he realized the boy would probably have ambushed him if he hadn't called him out. The assassin boy shrugged as he held up his short swords menacingly. My name is of no importance, but yours may be. It's not every day I get the chance to slay a region crosser. Nathan grinned. You saw me teleport in just now? The assassin nodded and eerily rubbed his short swords together, creating an uncomfortable grating sound. The bright flashing light gave you away immediately. I could have been miles away and still seen it. Well, so much for the element of surprise then. I guess that means every time I cross, I'll have to be ready for anybody who's looking for a fight. Oh, don't worry. You won't have that issue after I'm done with you. Now, I'll keep this simple. Two choices. Either lose your playing cards or lose your life. So, what's it gonna be? Nathan's eyes widened, surprised by the blatant threat. For a moment, the assassin thought that he had unnerved Nathan. That is, until Nathan burst out laughing. What? What's so funny? Nathan wiped tears from his eyes as he continued chuckling uncontrollably. He couldn't believe how many delusional warriors with mediocre skills he'd come across in the span of only a few days. Far too many weak bullies thought of themselves as genius warriors, and as Nathan calmed himself once more, he realized it was his job to humble them. Nothing. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> How dare you laugh at me? You'd better stop, or I'll gut you like a fish. This second threat sent Nathan into another fit of bellyaching laughter, totally having the opposite effect that the assassin boy had intended it to have. But Nathan couldn't help it. He'd already sensed that his latest enemy was barely a level 5 apprentice warrior, so he knew that the boy's threats were purely made through arrogance. To Nathan, this boy was hardly worth his time at all. As Nathan tried to stifle his own laughter, the assassin's face grew red with fury. He held his swords up threateningly as his eyes narrowed. I said stop laughing. That's it. I'll just have to take your cards from your cold, dead body. Prepare to face my blades. I'm not some pushover weakling like the warriors you fought over in your last region. The assassin took a wide offensive stance as he prepared to charge. Meanwhile, Nathan finally stopped chuckling and smiled broadly as he wagged a finger. I really wouldn't do that if I were you. Come on, let's talk about this. At least, let me ask you a few questions first. Ha! <laughs> Question this, asshole. The assassin charged as fast as he could with his short sword aimed at Nathan's face. Nathan shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. Some people were so full of themselves that they just couldn't be helped. As the assassin neared, Nathan drew his sword. Don't say I didn't warn you. Single point power lunge. Nathan swiftly lunged into his enemy's attack with the point of his broadsword aimed straight at the assassin's forehead. At the last moment, the assassin had instinctively tried to parry Nathan's lunge, but when his short blades came in contact with Nathan's broadsword, they were shattered instantly. The energy behind the blow sent the assassin flying back through the air before landing hard against the trunk of a tree. Blood spurted out of the assassin's mouth and ears as he lay up against the tree. Utterly helpless, as Nathan slowly approached and held the point of his blade up against the terrified warrior's neck, all the wounded boy could do was moan. Oh, my stomach! You... You ruptured something inside my stomach! This blood... It's black! 
Oh, heavens, save me. I, I, I can't believe this. Well, believe it, dumbass. You're lucky I held back my true power, you arrogant idiot. Now, you're going to tell me what I need to know. The wounded assassin gulped and trembled with fear as Nathan smiled devilishly down at him. You... Who the hell are you? Nathan's smile turned into a grimace. My name is Nathan Hayfield, and if you don't start answering my questions, I'll make sure you live to regret it. The wounded warrior's eyes widened with shock. Hayfield? It, it, it can't be. Is it really you? The Nathan Hayfield? The Demon Knight of Darkness? One of Nathan's eyebrows raised. Oh, so you've heard of me. My, my Godric's land relatives, they've told me stories. I never thought you'd look like this. <laughs> so now a legendary warrior has to look a certain way, is that it? I might not be built like a mountain, but my fists can break boulders larger than your family's house. The wounded warrior cowered and lowered his head respectively. Of course, young master. I apologize for my foolishness. Go ahead, ask me any questions that you wish. I will do my very best to answer them. Just for the love of the heavens, spare my life. We'll see whether or not you answer properly. Only then will I decide if you deserve another lease on life. I yes, of course, young master. Whatever you say. The wounded warrior's bravado had completely disappeared and all that remained was a scared youth who'd gotten in over his head. Even if he hadn't known Nathan's name, the force of his attack was enough to tell him that he was no match for Nathan's power. Nathan grinned as he pointed to a small bag tied to the assassin's belt loop. First things first, tell me, what's your number? The wounded warrior gulped and prayed to the heavens that his card did not match with Nathan's. Nathan's brow raised as he waited for the wounded warrior to reveal his playing card number. Well, what is it? What's your number? The wounded warrior sighed, then closed his eyes. It's the red six of clubs. Nathan's shoulders relaxed as he shrugged, more than a little disappointed. Uh, okay, um, do you happen to have any other cards on you? The wounded warrior smiled slightly, relieved that he did not have to duel Nathan further. He nodded his head, then winced at the pain from his wounds. As he spoke, a small dribble of blood flowed down from his mouth. Y yes, sir. Yes, I do. I have several. Do you happen to have any red or black seven diamonds? Hmm. The injured youth hesitated for a moment as his greed began to take over again. However, when he looked back up into Nathan's stern gaze, he quickly nodded his head. Well, actually, yes. I think I may have one of both of those cards. Oh, really? Are they in this bag here? Don't worry, you don't have to move. I can check it myself. Nathan's stern features melted once again into a smile as he examined the wounded boy's small bag and found several cards, including a red and black seven of diamonds. Fifty points richer, Nathan couldn't help but chuckle as he took the other seven cards worth two points each that were also in the bag. My oh my, what luck! I never thought it'd be this easy. In his head, Nathan couldn't help but thank the wounded boy for ambushing him so quickly. If the arrogant fool hadn't tried to attack him, Nathan was sure he would have spent days scouring the landscape of this region, looking in vain for the cards he needed. As Nathan smiled and pocketed the cards, the wounded warrior spit out a glob of blood and bile from his mouth. The injured boy couldn't help but despair at his situation and argue with himself over his own brashness. Damn it all. 
I've been such a fool. Why'd I have to go and attack this warrior right after he crossed over? I should have known that such a youth would be incredibly strong. Had I just observed him from afar and not gotten cocky, I may have lived to compete in this trial for another day. As Nathan finished pocketing the playing cards, he couldn't help but notice tears welling up in the corners of the wounded warrior's eyes. Nathan sighed, then shook his head, already regretting what he was about to do. You said you were the Six of Clubs. Yes. Yes, I was. Reluctantly, Nathan opened up his pockets and whipped out the youth's personal card. He carefully tucked it into the wounded boy's tunic pocket. Before the injured youth could open his mouth to question him, Nathan pulled a small silver necklace chain up from around his neck. Inside of it was a small vial of the potion of internal healing. Open up. What? Open. Stick your tongue out. Nathan swiftly uncorked the vial and placed a single drop on the wounded boy's tongue. Nathan stifled a chuckle as he saw the youth's wide-eyed and fearful expression. No doubt, the youth thought that Nathan planned to poison him and rob him of a peaceful death. Don't worry yourself. This potion is used to treat internal injuries. Your muscles may be stiff afterwards, but you'll definitely live to see another sunrise. Give it four hours, and then you should be able to move normally again. Seeing as you've done as I have asked of you, I have decided to spare your life and give you another chance. Your card is in your tunic pocket, but I have taken the rest. Whether or not you continue on with the trial is entirely up to you now. Nathan smiled confidently as he stepped away from the dumbstruck youth. After all, he had no need to stay in this region much longer anyways. Now that he had those additional points, his total score tallied 240 points. Although he knew there were still a few valuable cards somewhere out in this region, he knew that tracking those warriors down would be slower than simply crossing over to a new place with available matching cards for him to find. With many more random two-point cards in his possession now, he hoped in the next region he'd be able to trade more freely without stumbling into another duel. The injured youth couldn't believe his eyes as Nathan activated his playing card once again and began to glow yellow. What? You're leaving so soon? But you only just got here. Nathan couldn't help but grin as purple runes began to dance around him. He gave the boy a thumbs up. Don't worry, kid. I like to travel. Another blinding flash of purple light exploded out of Nathan's card, and by the time the wounded warrior blinked, his strange young opponent had disappeared entirely. It was the end of dawn in the encampment outside of Calandriana, and most of the Doom Faction Acolytes were still asleep. A few healers were working on some severely wounded trial takers who had teleported out the night before, but otherwise the camp was quiet. The trial judge himself was not so fortunate. He'd spent most of the night racking his brain over all the different tasks he needed to complete and oversee. Despite all of his work, he also couldn't shake Officer Wilhelm's orders from his mind. As he drank tea and ate a meal of warm porridge for breakfast, he couldn't help but secretly hope that the Hayfield boy would get stuck in whatever region he'd gone into. The less he had to deal with the boy, the less work he'd have to do. Yet, just as he was about to take another bite of food, a purple flash of light blazed out behind him. The trial judge set down his bowl and stood up to greet the latest arrival. His brow furrowed as he looked up at the golden sky around him. Who could be coming through so early in the morning? Usually, the fighting's stopped by now, so it can't be one of the injured youths. Perhaps it's someone who is giving up. Usually, those folks drop in the first day or so, but I guess we do occasionally get some that last most of a week. However, 
As soon as the trial judge turned around and saw Nathan again, his jaw immediately dropped. You, you, you again? But you only just crossed over late last night. Nathan couldn't help but shrug bashfully as he nodded at the older man. <laughs> well, I guess I just got lucky. I'm here to apply for another crossing. Hopefully this time someplace a little more exotic. The trial judge couldn't believe it. His eyes twitched as he frantically stroked his long white beard to calm himself. You want to apply to cross again? Really? But how could you have gathered enough points to do this again overnight? You know that each time you cross, the number needed doubles. So do you really have 160 points already? E yes Here, I'll show you myself. What can I say? I guess the heavens have blessed me. Nathan chuckled as he nodded at the judge and produced 160 points worth of cards from his bag. Based on the older man's reaction, he decided not to tell him that he actually possessed 240 points in total already. Here you are, sir. I believe these cards here will cover the application cost. As the trial judge counted them out, several acolytes woken up by the ruckus came over to investigate. A few of them simply marveled at Nathan, while two others helped the trial judge count out the cards. After a few moments of this, the trial judge could only scratch his head as he handed Nathan back his cards. The judge and all of his acolytes were completely bewildered, partially because of the early hour and partially because of Nathan's insane progress. The judge cleared his throat and blinked twice before nodding. Your cards are valid. Congratulations. Please prepare for the second crossing. Nathan nodded and smiled, enjoying the Doom Faction's surprise at his results. He winked at the old man as he stepped over to the front gates of the city. Thank you, good sir. I hope to see you all again soon. The judge was speechless as he nodded at his acolytes who activated their spiritual energies and, together, used the teleportation incantation. As soon as the portal opened, Nathan casually strolled inside as if he were going on an afternoon walk through a park. As soon as Nathan disappeared, the acolytes closed the portal and began to whisper amongst themselves in hushed tones about what had happened. The trial judge sighed as he stared over at his warm breakfast and knew that he had to let it cool while he went and informed his superiors. The judge swiftly left the scene and leaped up onto an unoccupied section of the city walls to once again inform Officer Wilhelm of what had just transpired. As he activated his enchanted ring, Officer Wilhelm's half-asleep voice echoed out into the night. What? What is it? This better be good. I was in the middle of an amazing dream. The trial judge sighed. I'm sorry to wake you, sir, but something insane just happened. And unless I'm going crazy or imagined it, you're going to want to hear this. The sun shone brightly above the distant horizon, announcing the morning to all of the residents of Calandria who would slowly begin their daily routines. Shops would open, meals would be made, and baths would be taken. However, up on the top of Mount Cal, the Doom Faction headquarters had been alive and buzzing for several hours already. As the bright morning light blasted into Officer Wilhelm's observation deck, the four deputy officers waited patiently as their master paced back and forth anxiously in front of them as he spoke into his enchanted ring. What? No, seriously, seriously? Uh, very well, then. You know what to do. And I want that observation globe finished as soon as possible. Prioritize that over everything else. Well, perhaps not over healing the wounded, but everything besides that, okay? Finally, Officer Wilhelm stopped pacing and shook his head with disbelief. Seeing his master's expressive face, Deputy Kane locked eyes with his fellow deputies and then stepped forward to address his boss. Excuse me, sir, but what just happened? 
I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're extremely curious why you summoned us so early in the morning. Suddenly, a large grin formed on Officer Wilhelm's face as he looked over at the younger man. If you had a guess, Kane, what would you suppose just happened? I suppose if you'd make me guess that another trial taker is applied to cross. Officer Wilhelm shuddered as he held up a finger and shook his head. Almost! You almost got it, Kane. Someone did indeed teleport out to the examination grounds, but they did not just apply to cross. Oh no! They just applied for their second crossing. Suddenly, all four deputies' eyes bulged. They were floored by their master's news. Such a thing happened only rarely during the Doom Faction trials, and usually it was only done by the strongest of 20-year-olds, who did so very late into the trial. All four deputies spoke the words aloud at the same time, as they tried to get a grip on what their master had just said. A second crossing? Officer Kane shook his head, utterly amazed. Well, that can only mean one thing. Nathan Hayfield got enough points to cross over again in a single night. Officer Wilhelm walked over to the glass-covered observation deck within the Doom Faction headquarters and stared down thoughtfully at the distant trial-taker encampment outside of the city walls. You are correct, Deputy Kane. It was the Hayfield boy once again. Behind him, the four deputy officers couldn't help but whisper frantically amongst themselves. That's impossible. Nobody's ever crossed twice in the same 24-hour period before. There's no way he hasn't cheated. How could he have cheated? We built the magic fences there ourselves. We spent months looking for the perfect regions to host them. We've gone over even the smallest details of the competition a thousand times. Two crossings, though, at this pace? Even if we were to enter the trial, we wouldn't be able to cross that quickly. Perhaps the boy is lucky, or well-blessed by the heavens. Hmm. Besides immeasurable strength, he'd need more luck than all four of us combined to pull this off. Nathan's results had once again startled the four deputies, but this time to a level that very nearly frightened them. Even Deputy Kane, who had previously been confident in Nathan's ability to qualify within the top 100, was shocked by Nathan's absolutely crushing performance in the trial so far. Before Deputy Kane could ask Officer Wilhelm for more information, Deputy Ragnar of the Herald's Land fiefdom cleared her throat and stepped forward. Officer Wilhelm, I have a question. Go ahead, Ragnar. Speak freely. Deputy Ragnar nodded. I think it's clear to all of us that Nathan Hayfield has already far exceeded our previous expectations. I suggest that we inform the faction leadership at once. I know they are already aware of him, but his most recent actions prove he's a far more valuable asset than our initial reports indicated. I can only imagine that, at this rate, Nathan will cross at least two or even three times more before the end of the trial. Such a result would rank him amongst the strongest trial-goers to ever take the examination in the entire history of the faction. If that's the case, wouldn't it be better to inform our superiors sooner rather than later, so that they can prepare the boy for life within the faction and ensure that his allegiance stays with us? Head Officer Wilhelm rubbed his beard thoughtfully as he listened to Ragnar's words. Hmm... You do raise a good point. The boy's talent is extraordinary. If he should move quickly before other factions try to swoop in and steal him away from us. Officer Kane shook his head as he once again stepped forward. Officer Wilhelm, it is my understanding that Nathan Hayfield would never betray his homeland. Uh, besides, he believes his future with us holds the key to solving his mother's murder. Deputy Ragnar scoffed and shook her head. Pardon my interruption, but what happens when he finds out that we might not be able to deliver on your promises, Kane? Sure, 
Our scholars might be able to help, but if the boy's missing murderer is unable to be found, that could spell trouble for us down the line. Cain merely shrugged. I would do everything in my power to help the boy track down his mother's killer. I doubt he'd grow to resent us, as you imagine he would. Ragnar gritted her teeth. Even so, we should not risk our faction's future based solely on your opinions, Deputy Kane. Besides, so what if the boy himself is loyal? If his family members can be tempted away, don't you think he'll side with them over us? But the High Lord Hayfield has no reason to wish to leave his homeland now. He's always proven loyal to his fiefdom in the past, even when he's been suppressed by them. Exactly my point. We all know Nathan's family history by now. The Hayfields have not always been well treated by the Kingdom of Calandria. Sure, they've held their tongue about it before, but now that their power is rising up again, it is not crazy to think that they might be willing to switch their allegiances for the right price. I am telling you, I don't think Nathan would ever agree to that. We should not push him on this, or he may begin to question our intentions. If he knows we're trying to keep him from speaking to the other factions, that may only make him more curious to reach out to them. And I'm telling you, the Doom faction can't risk letting his power fall into the wrong hands. If one of our rivals corrupts him before we have a chance to intervene, we will have allowed preventable disaster to occur. You don't understand. You've never spoken with him. He's not like other lads his age. We need him to want to join us on his own. If you try to twist his arm, or shower him in bribes, he'll know something fishy and fight back. Sounds like someone else I know. Is that a jab at me, Deputy Ragnar? Because if I'm remembering properly, he's from my fiefdom, which would make him my responsibility, not yours. Perhaps, for the time being, we'll see what happens when the leadership hears all of this. Just as Deputy Kane opened his mouth to retort, Head Officer Wilhelm clapped his hands together roughly, causing snow outside of the window to fall into a slow-moving avalanche. That's enough out of both of you. I understand the concerns on both sides of this issue. And my order is this. We will continue to observe Nathan's progress for now. Two crossings might still be considered within the realm of pure luck. However, if he crosses into another region again, I'll alert the faction leadership immediately myself. Now is that understood? Deputy Kane and Deputy Ragnar locked eyes with one another. Then, reluctantly, they nodded at their commanding officer. Yes, sir. A bright purple light flashed, and suddenly, Nathan once again appeared inside a new region. This time, the landscape resembled the high plains that Nathan had once seen in a scroll about the far eastern reaches of the planet. Hmm. Well, at least it's not just another endless forest. I could get used to this. Tall, rolling grasslands stretched out for miles in all directions as Nathan tried to get his bearings within an ocean of green. The wind whistled loudly, throwing up the tall grass stalks around him and thus revealing a shallow pond off in the distance a few miles away. Seeing that as the only noticeable landmark, as well as the only water source, Nathan rushed toward it, since he knew that it would be a major source of foot traffic for the region. No matter what strategy an individual warrior of this land employed, all of them would eventually have to make the journey over to the pond to grab some water. Knowing that he was most likely being watched from deep within the tall grass, Nathan leapt across the hilltops as fast as he could. He did not wish to appear as a threat to any nearby warriors, but he also did not want to openly expose himself to another cocky assassin type. This time around, Nathan wanted to try an entirely new strategy to amass more points. 
As Nathan arrived at the shallow pond, he cupped some water into his palms and drank slowly, savoring every drop. Satisfied that the water was drinkable, Nathan rehydrated and then ate a breakfast of walnuts he had taken with him from the last region. Nathan blinked as he tried to keep his eyes open. Finally, he decided to curl up beside the water and have a little nap. Hours passed, and when Nathan woke, the sun was high up above him in the sky. Rather than wake to a blade at his neck or a challenger approaching, Nathan's nose was tickled by a blade of grass. As he sat up, he sensed that six or seven individual warriors were watching him from afar through the high grass. Nathan smiled as he boldly yawned and waved out at them. He knew that due to the lack of tree coverage, they must have seen the bright flashing light in the distance that brought Nathan into their region. Therefore, all of them knew that Nathan would be a strong opponent, and this assumption was further reinforced by his willingness to casually nap beside the region's central gathering point. Almost a week into the trial now, few cocky weaklings remained, and most of the survivors at this point had learned how to be cautious and observant when approaching a potential enemy. However, this also made them extremely paranoid, which was an obstacle to Nathan's true intentions. After Nathan finished stretching, he walked over to a large boulder beside the pond and drew his blade. Within a few swift cuts, Nathan carved two words into the stone, then sheathed his blade and sat cross-legged beneath it. The stone message said, Card Trader. Next, Nathan casually turned to where he knew the warriors were hiding out and announced his intentions loudly for all to hear. Good afternoon, fellow warriors. My card is the Red Seven of Diamonds. If you have that card or a black version of that card, please come out from the tall grass to trade with me. I have a variety of cards from several other regions, and if I have a match for what you need, I am happy to swap with you. Nathan's eyes scanned the flowing green horizon as he sensed the warriors coming closer to hear him better. Some were clearly more reluctant than others. I'll do our transaction right here, out in the open, in front of everyone, without any funny business. As long as you come to me honestly, I will not draw my blade. But if you try to cheat or ambush me, I'll simply add your playing cards to my large pile. Okay? Nathan's superior hearing cut through the whistling wind and heard several of them consider the offer in hushed tones. However, most of them simply snorted disdainfully and moved along. The remaining warriors had clearly seen someone else fall for such tricks before and did not have any reason to trust Nathan's words. However, a small subgroup remained behind as the others fled. These few warriors watched Nathan vigilantly and clearly did not wish to be surprised by him. Although they all needed to use the pond for water on occasion, distant storm clouds told Nathan that many of them had other ways of obtaining water. Those with strong construction skills would have easily manufactured rainwater catchers, but there was no immediate need for anyone to confront him. Realizing all this, Nathan hummed to himself as he sat in the large rock's shade and laid out all of his two-point cards on the ground before him. As the hours passed by, the storm clouds disappeared from the horizon, and Nathan began to idly skip stones across the pond and weave stalks of dead grass into a basket. By the time the sun was lowering in the sky, Nathan's basket of dead grass had been completed, and now all of his spare playing cards were housed inside of it. Despite occasionally calling out to the tall grass where he knew he was being watched, no warriors would approach his trading stall as they feared it was a trap. Nathan scratched his head as he tried to figure out how to let his observers know that his trading offer was genuine. Come on, there's got to be a way I can convince them of giving me a chance. I can't just waste my days away sitting here like this. But at the same time, I don't want to keep fighting everyone I meet. Only I could figure this out. 
As night fell, Nathan sighed as he repositioned himself beneath a bed of dried grass and went to sleep. His mind raced while he sought to figure out what he could do to put his fellow warriors at ease. Tall blades of grass flowed in the wind and tickled Nathan's face as he slowly woke again to find himself beside a small pond in an endless stretch of rolling grasslands. For a moment, Nathan's eyes widened as he failed to recognize where he was, but as the events of yesterday came flooding back into his brain, he calmed down and slowly stood up and stretched. He checked the small stony beach beside the pond for boot prints, but once again, there were no signs of warriors coming up to him in the night. Unnerved by the lack of conflict or social interaction, Nathan grew excited when he sensed a warrior crouched in the nearby tall grass watching him. This one had approached far closer than the other distant observers, so he knew the kid wished to interact with him. The nervous youth had been observing Nathan for the past day and a half, and he was struggling to endure the temptation of a trade. He was not particularly strong, but he knew that he possessed two Black Seven Diamond cards that other warriors had lost or dropped early on during the trial. Despite this, he had only 16 points so far, and he knew that he would fail to qualify within the top 100 unless he took a major risk. As he'd waited in the grass, he'd come close enough to spot the many different playing cards in Nathan's possession. One of those cards just so happened to be a red king of clubs. The card matched his own. To give up two nearly worthless cards for one worth 30 points was a great bargain. But even now, the boy couldn't help but regret his decision to come closer to his strange trader. The nervous youth had seen other traders try to set up shops at the pond before, and every time, they turned out to be tricksters that lured their naive trade partners to their death. This time, however, Nathan's voice seemed more genuine, and as he smiled calmly in the youth's direction, the boy was unable to resist. The nervous youth scuttled up to Nathan and gulped as he fished out his two Black Seven Diamond cards. His eyes widened as Nathan beamed at him and approached just close enough for him to see what the boy possessed. Ah, splendid. I see you have two cards I need. Which of these cards would you like to trade for them? The, uh, the Red King of Clubs. Without a second thought, Nathan grabbed the card from his wicker basket and set it on a rock before slowly stepping back away. He spoke as if he was talking down a skittish horse. There you go. It's all yours. Wait, just like that? You don't need me to pass you mine first? Not at all, friend. I trust you'll do right by me as I've done right by you. Just place your cards down on that stone after you take my trade. The nervous youth smiled as his tense shoulders lowered for the first time in days. The rest of the transaction went smoothly as the boy departed with a card worth 30 points, and Nathan received 40 points from the two cards in return. Nathan smiled and happily skipped a stone across the pond as he pocketed his new cards. His mind raced as he couldn't help but grin. Finally, my plan is working. A couple more good trades like this? and I'll be in a good spot to cross over into another region as well. Nathan spun around at the sound of a sudden noise, but immediately relaxed when he realized that word of his honesty had already spread. Half a dozen other warriors had been observing Nathan's transaction with the nervous boy, and once it was clear that the trade had worked out, warriors had leapt at the chance to gain points without conflict. Nathan blinked, and four different warriors appeared out of the tall grass before his very eyes. Friends, welcome to my stall. As I've said before, I'll trade honestly with any of you that has a card that matches mine. Otherwise, I'm afraid I'm not open to a trade unless you're willing to make it worth my while. One of the four warriors immediately raised her hand 
as a short girl approached him. Me. Here, I have a red seven of diamonds. I'd like that black four of hearts you've got over there. Nathan beamed as he nodded his head. Sure thing. It's a trade. Over the girl's shoulder, another warrior, anxious to acquire one of Nathan's cards, raised his hand to him. What if I give you three of my cards? Three? How about four cards? Four? But I'd only be getting one in return. Please, don't try to short sell my kid. If I get you 30 points, I ought to get at least four cards in return for my trouble. The boy sighed and nodded his head reluctantly. I know, I get it. It's just that I only have three cards to offer you. Nathan smiled as he finished his transaction with the shorter girl, who immediately dashed off back into the grass. Then he thought for a moment as the tall boy approached him with pleading eyes. Nathan stood protectively over his basket of playing cards, then sighed at the boy's desperate expression. Well, all right. I'll do it for three cards if you sweeten the pot. What else do you have to offer? I'll throw in a bird I hunted down this morning. I was going to cook it up for a stew. But you can have it if you wish. Deal. Nathan and the tall boy shook hands and swiftly traded cards without a fuss. As the sun rose high into the sky, Nathan completed a few more simple transactions and racked up even more points. By early evening, Nathan sat over a crackling fire and roasted a mid-sized pheasant that the tall boy had given him earlier in the day. Pleased with his decision to trade instead of fight, Nathan's thoughts swirled around the idea of crossing over into a new region the very next day. So what if there are one more red seven of diamonds somewhere out there in these grassy hills? Why waste my time tracking it down or fighting when I could just do this again in another area? and keep gaining points with ease. As Nathan munched on the delicious roasted bird, he resolved to continue his trading strategy and to apply for crossing at first light. As dawn rose back in the trial taker's encampment outside of the kingdom's capital city, the trial judge sighed as he wiped the sweat from his brow. He'd spent most of the previous night working nonstop with his top acolytes to craft an observation globe for head officer Wilhelm and the other deputies. Knowing their intense desire to watch Nathan's progress, he'd spent nearly all of his spiritual energy on the globe and was now in dire need of a long rest. As the trial judge headed off toward his own large tent, his thoughts lingered on a pot of herbal tea he planned to make before going to sleep. Just as he reached the outer flaps of his tent, the skin pricked up on the back of his neck when he suddenly heard a large noise. A blinding light appeared right outside of the front gate of the city, and, to the dry old judge's horror, Nathan Hayfield stepped forward, grinning once again. Before the boy's eyes could locate the judge, the old man cursed under his breath. Heaven help me, not this kid again. Every time I think I've got a moment to relax, he comes barging back here and makes my job ten times harder. Nathan smiled as his eyes locked with the trial judge. As Nathan beckoned the old man over, the judge couldn't help but shake his head and grumble. Well, lad, what is it now? Another application to cross, I assume? Nathan nodded and quickly produced a number of matching cards worth the 240 points necessary to cross over into a new region for a third time. Yes, sir. I have the required points just here. Please, count them at your leisure. As the trial judge examined the card, he was less surprised this time, and more annoyed at the boy's persistent nature. Slowly, the trial judge sighed and raised an eyebrow at the boy. Tell me, kid... What in heaven's name is driving you on like this? I'm sorry? What do you mean, sir? What's your motivation? I mean, most warriors who've come close to this many points would call it a day and hide out for the rest of the month in some cave somewhere. 
Why are you willing to keep pushing yourself like this? Hmm. I guess I really hadn't thought about it like that before. I mean, I'd like to win overall for my father and sister. It would be nice for our family name to grow more powerful. The exhausted trial judge couldn't help but shake his head and wag a knowing finger at the boy. Despite his better judgment, he could hold his tongue no longer. But if that were the only reason, why risk your points so recklessly like this? Would it not be smarter to save up a large sum and then protect it at all costs? Every time you cross, you're thrown into a completely unknown environment. Every time you increase the chances of you losing everything to some unforeseen event or enemy. So what is it really? Why are you trying so hard to prove yourself like this? Nathan listened to the older man's words, then thoughtfully considered his response. Finally, Nathan's smile faded as he stared off into the distance. Honestly, sir, I couldn't give less of a shit about this trial. What's that? Nathan's hands clenched into fists as his expression grew dark. He smiled bitterly at the old man. I'm sure I'm doing this to join the Doom Faction, and acquiring a fiefdom for my father would be great. But the only reason I'm doing any of this is to get access to the resources I need to find my mother's killer. And when I do find that man, whoever he is, I need to be strong enough to avenge her. If I hide out in a cave somewhere... I wouldn't get as strong as I need to be. The trial judge's eyes widened. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Boy, are are you saying you're using this trial as a form of training? Nathan smiled and slowly nodded his head. It's better training than what I'd find at home. That's for certain. Now, please, can you approve my crossing request so I can find more points and face more enemies. I'm close to breaking through a spiritual fighting level, and I don't want to lose my momentum. The trial judge slowly nodded his head as he turned to two nearby acolytes who were finishing up their breakfasts by a nearby campfire. You two, over there! Activate a teleportation incantation spell and send this warrior through. Congratulations, boy. Good luck with the next region. The old man bowed respectfully toward Nathan, then headed back off toward his tent to rest. Although he knew he ought to contact Officer Wilhelm immediately, he was too tired to care anymore. Besides, the man couldn't help but think that when he woke up, he'd see Nathan standing over him asking for another crossing anyways. <laughs>